I don't want to go into long, lengthy introductions, mostly because I don't have any notes here to read of long, lengthy introductions. I'll just briefly say how honored we, ha we are to have Professor Hayek with us. Last year, he treated us to uh, an account of his controversies with Keynes at the LSE in the 1930s. And just to show the versatility of, of, uh, of Professor Hayek and the wide-ranging interests that he has, this year he's going to talk on an entirely different subject. This year he's going to be talking about some work he has been doing over the last couple of years on the problem of culture, uh, broadly conceived as the problem of cultural evolution and the, and the emergence of the rules by which societies um, function. Today the specific topic that he's going to talk to us about, and I'm going to have to read the, the title here, is uh, the rules of morality are not the conclusions of our reason. And he's going to explain to us what he means by this. So I now give you Professor Friedrich Hayek. Madam, ladies and gentlemen, against all my habits, I propose today to read a paper to you. The reason is that this particular lecture is built up around so many quotations that I shouldn't remember them properly at their proper place, and I'm really dependent on my manuscript. The lecture was actually written uh, to be given at the Heritage Foundation in uh, Washington a few days ago, and was then announced under the title, The Origins and Effects of Our Morals, A Problem for Science. Now I had chosen this rather clumsy title to uh, defend myself in advance against uh, making the unforgivable mistake of introducing value judgments into a scientific argument. Now that of course has been shown to be inappropriate by David Hume long before Max Weber, who made it popular in recent times. And I should have much better taken from the very passage in which David Hume concludes that uh, science can never justify value judgments. He states really my main topic I want to discuss, and the best title, which the chairman has already read, is a quotation from David Hume, to which I shall refer several times, namely the contention that the rules of morality are not the conclusions of our reason. I hope to show you that the significance of this concise statement has over the years become very much greater than even David Hume could have foreseen. Although they are not the conclusions of our reason, the traditional rules of morality are nevertheless an indispensable condition of the very existence of present mankind, which we cannot alter at will to please our wishes, which we can at most hope gradually to develop or to improve within a framework which is given to us as a necessary condition. Now it must now be a quarter of a century ago <coughs> that I first recognized what I then called the twin concepts of evolution and spontaneous order, which had provided the key to the explanation of those complex phenomena that had not yielded to the endeavor of a causal, or sometimes called nomothetic or nomological uh, approach, which had been so successful in the study of the more simple phenomena of mechanics and related subject. We call those things which are explainable by nomothetic rules of physical world, and uh, within it, our power of prediction and control have reached a height which has led men to the fatal conceit 
that his powers of construction may enable him also in the same manner to construct his human surroundings as he has succeeded in constructing his material surroundings. It became then clear to me <coughs> that although Charles Darwin's successful application of uh, his ideas of evolution to the account for the origin of the different organic species, although this was the first grandiose success of this line of thought due to an industrious empirical research which you cannot enough admire, the intellectual source of the idea of evolution lay not in the study of nature, but in the study of the even more complex phenomena of human interaction. But in the study of this even more complex phenomena of the formation of language and law, already the scholars of ancient Rome, fully aware of the kinship of the efforts, had first developed ideas of evolution. And it was again the students of law, of nature, and of the common law, who in modern times returned to the conception of evolution, with then Bernard Mandeville and the Scottish philosophers of the 18th century extended to an explanation of morals and of such economic phenomena as money, exchange and the market. The dominant figure in this development was undoubtedly David Hume, with his most profound insight at which he arrived, and which I have made the title of this lecture, <coughs> that the rules of morality are not the conclusions of our reason. Now this assertion at once raises in the acutest form the question of to what else then our morals are due. Particularly in the case of Hume, who had made it so obviously clear that he did not believe in some supernatural origin of the things. But it was also a clear misunderstanding of Hume by modern scholars to assume a utilitarian explanation which of course is explicitly excluded by the assertion that the morals are not the conclusions of our reason. Now the answer to this problem was indeed given some 20 years ago in a work which has not been sufficiently uh, honoured by a gentleman called C. Bay, B-A-Y, called The Structure of Freedom, who justly maintained that Hume may be called the precursor of Darwin in the field of ethics. Indeed, he was that not only in the field of ethics. The suggestion of a general theory of evolution is to be found in his posthumous Dialogues on Natural Religion, which laid the foundation not only for the theory of social evolution, which then his Scottish successors, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, and Duke <coughs> Stewart, fully developed. It's clear also that no, it is clearly also no accident that has now been established from the study of the notebooks of Charles Darwin that the idea of biological evolution occurred to him at the very time when he was reading not Mortus but the Bench of Nations. <coughs> I've recently come across yet another piece of evidence confirming my old contention that the concept of evolution derives from the study of society, which I might just briefly mention here, is that the term genetics, which only 17 years ago, 70 years ago by William Bateson was made the technical term for biological evolution, 
actually derives from literature and the study of language. It derives from the German literary usage in the 18th century by Herder, Wieland and Friedrich Schiller and beginning of the 19th century Wilhelm von Humboldt who speak of the genetic problems of evolution of language. The word was then borrowed or introduced into English by Thomas Carlyle. But even after Darwin we still find an economist like Karl Menger speaking about the genetic origin of money and similar phenomena without any reference to biological phenomena. So it, I think this <coughs> development of language shows clearly how the whole idea of evolution comes from the study of society and therefore it's not a misapplication to use it again to account for the development of social phenomena and particularly the development of our morals. Now, adopt, accepting that in both fields we have to rely on the concept of evolution must however not the mi make the mistake which the so-called social Darwinists in the last century made of taking over the description of the technique of evolution. Social evolution, uh, cultural evolution as I shall call it, and biological evolution have two things, but only two things in common. They operate by the same principle of selection in the first instance. And that principle of selection is that those attributes, characteristics, habits or whatever they are, which assisted the multiplication of the species were selected at the price of others. And they have a second fact in common, neither biological evolution nor cultural evolution knew such a things as laws of evolution. The laws of evolution which we find in Hegel, in Marx, in Kant, and most modern sociologists have nothing at all to do with the theory of evolution. In fact, since the theory of evolution is an account of how we, or how in, uh, structures adapt themselves to unforeseen events, it includes a predictive law of evolution which tells us in advance where evolution must lead. But now to the points where <coughs> cultural evolution and biological evolution differ. The first, I won't enumerate them all, there are a list of six or seven, but I will pick out the really important ones. The first and most obvious one is, of course, that while modern theory of biological evolution explicitly excludes the possibility of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, cultural evolution rests solely on the transmission of acquired characteristics. Secondly, while biological evolution rests wholly on the transmission of physiological attributes from parents to children, we can inherit intellectual and moral qualities from a large number of ancestors, not in the physiological sense, but just predecessors. Now, apart from several other differences, I will concentrate on one which is of crucial importance for me, and that is this. I think cultural evolution rests chiefly on what is called group selection in contrast to biological evolution, which most biologists just at this moment believe does not operate by group selection. I'm not convinced that they are really right. I don't believe it's impossible even to get through biological evolution without taking account of the possibility of group selection. But that's a matter for the biologists to decide and not for me. For my purpose, the important point on whichever thing turns is that 
cultural evolution operates entirely by group selection and this is the account this is the reason why we do not know what it has done if the preservation of new habits is based on effects not on the person who practice the habits but the Schoenitzev on the group as a whole and the group is selected because these habits are practiced within it nobody need know about it nobody need be aware of this effect and that explains why some traditions can go up without ever having been deliberately designed without ever having been understood by the people and without ever having even in retrospect being understood by the people who are here and practice to them. Now, this is a, also the reason why traditional moral rules have always and consistently been the target of all rationalists and utilitarianism, all that regard that only that is valid which can be rationally justified and that we must discard all other beliefs. Now let me illustrate this by some definition which you find in contemporary works of the chief concepts of the philosophical attitudes which reject tradition or traditional beliefs as legitimate and even essential guides of our action. They are essentially rationalism, positivism and utilitarian ethics. Now I take my quotations from what I find a very useful handbook a thing called the Dictionary of Modern Thought in England where it first appeared called the Fontana Dictionary of Modern Thought in America republished as the Harper Dictionary of Modern Thought where most of the important philosophical articles are published by a distinguished Oxford philosopher of the name of Anthony Quinton now Lord Quinton and I will give you briefly his definitions of rationalism, positivism and utilitarian ethics. Now, according to uh, excuse me, rationalism, according to definition, I'm not coming to these quotations which I need, but uh, no, uh, I haven't got to them yet, so forgive me. I <laughs> will keep to my manuscript and postpone this for a moment. What I say in my manuscript, that I may continue with it, is that the cause of what I have been discussing is that uh, the philosophy of rationalism, which dominates modern thought since the 17th century, has succeeded progressively to discredit all beliefs which are not based on intellectual insight, including that moral tradition which, if I may repeat the phrase, the rules of morality are not the conclusion of our reason, make our inheritance an autonomous endowment, I call it autonomous in the sense of a creation of human reason. I mean by it, it's a value of its own, independent, or partly independent on the intellectual support or justification we can give for it. It is a treasure distinct from, in some respects even superior to reason, because it allows us to take account of effects of our action, of which our senses, and therefore our individual reason, could not take account of. In short, it was an ununderstood moral tradition and not rational knowledge of fact 
which enabled mankind to form that extended order of individual interaction, which makes it possible for us to sustain today something like 200 times the population of uh, the hu humanity which existed 5,000 years ago. I am convinced that this expansion of humanity and of what we call civilization, which made it possible, became possible at least as much, if not more, than by our growing intelligence, by certain moral beliefs which man has never invented because of foreknown effects, but which were preserved without his understanding. And it was the adherence to these moral beliefs which enabled man to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the world and subdue it, as already said, it's the first part of the Bible in the book of Genesis. Now, the two fundamental moral principles for which those human groups who practice them were selected for progressive multiplication by cultural evolution, yet against which both the human intellect and our sentiments constantly revolt, were the ru rules which define the institutions of private, or as I prefer to call it, several property, and the rules of the family. I shall have neither time nor am I competent to discuss the very real problems which changes of knowledge have in modern times raised with regard to the institution of the family. And I must confine myself here entirely to the institution around which, of course, the present political discussion, the present political divisions chiefly turn the institution of private or several property, especially the property as a means of production, or more fully, to quote again David Hume, when I speak about the institution of property, what I mean, the institution of the stability of possessions, of its transference by consent, and of the performance of promises. That while I abbreviated form I shall refer to as the institution of property. When we look for it, we find the significance of these basic conceptions for the formation of an extended order of human interaction, all clearly stated in the work of Adam Smith. And uh, for the purpose of this particular exposition, I've chosen to describe the main steps by quoting Adam Smith uh, in a, a few passages which are so familiar, or at least ought to be so familiar, that one is almost ashamed to quote them. But I think in the context they assume rather a new significance. I think you all will remember Smith, and I shall raise a finger when I quote to distinguish between what I, my own. Nobody ever saw one animal by its gestures and natural cries signify to another, this is mine, that is yours. I am willing to give this for that. In other words, it was proper than the exchange that the distinction, the distinctly human aspects begin to guide cultural evolution. And again, the division of labor is not originally the effect of any human wisdom. And as it is the power of exchanging that gives occasion to the division of labor, so the extent of this division must always be limited by the extent of this power, or in other words, the extent of the market. And the most decisive mark of the prosperity of any people is the increase of the number of its inhabitants. And then uh, one at first apparently unconnected, but the really most profound statement, religion, even in its crudest form, 
gave a sanction to the rules of morality long before the age of artificial reasoning and morality. What Adam Smith here evidently clearly saw was that man had never adopted the morals of property and exchange because he foresaw the benefits he would derive from them. This had been mystical or supernatural beliefs that make groups stick to traditions of certain practical or ceremonial uh, practices or ceremonials long enough to give natural selection a chance to pick out those groups who practice the truth which led to their multiplication and make them di displace others who practice different ones. Now this is really the answer of what I might call Hume's problem. How did morals arise if they did not arise from human invention? If, as he says, the rules of morality are not the conclusion of our reason, what are they due to? The human answer given to it by Smith is selective evolution. And the result is a decisive recognition that most of humanity owed their very lives to this traditional observation of rules, which they did not like because they constituted the restraints on their innate instincts, nor were they able intellectually to justify them. Now, if morals has a distinct power which lies between the power of instincts and the power of reason, even as an endowment is equivalent, or in some respects perhaps even superior to reason, so it is because it enabled man to take account of circumstances beyond or outside the range of his perception and by practices which were accepted by religious men who believed in a superior power like the human mind but of greater penetration that had thus arranged things. But this belief became unacceptable to the 17th century rationalists and their descendants. The Enlightenment was intended precisely to free us from all such traditional beliefs excuse me, in the truth, not to speak of about a possible superior wisdom of moral rules which men could not intellectually justify. This was wholly irreconcilable to the rationalism of Thomas Hobbes or René Descartes down to the beliefs of the French Enlightenment and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or even Hegel, Marx and Kant. And it turns out that it is still necessarily unacceptable to their contemporary followers. I now come to the point I wanted to make before to show that this is in conflict with the basic tenets of uh, such influential philosophical traditions as rationalism, positivism, and utilitarian ethics. And for this purpose, I use these quotations that I've mentioned before, when I thought I'd already come to that stage, taken from the Dictionary of Modern Thought by contributions under the respective headings by Anthony Quinton of Oxford. Now, again, I shall mark my quotations by raising my finger to make quite clear what is quotation. For a rationalist who denies the acceptability of beliefs founded on anything but experience or reasoning, the definition of a rationalist, or for a positivist believing that all true knowledge is scientific, in the sense of describing the coexistence and succession of observable phenomena. Or even for a believer in the usual form of hedonist ethics, 
utilitarianism, which takes pleasure and pain for everyone affected, affected by it, to be the criterion of an action's rightness, traditional morals must be rejected as irrational. They do not satisfy the conditions of truth, which rationalism, which positivism, or which even hedonistic ethics, utilitarianism, makes a condition of the acceptability of any statement. It would not be possible to produce generations of, it would, <coughs> uh, what I was saying was, uh, these beliefs could not but produce generations of intellectuals of whom we might well regard Lord Kings as a prototype since he told us explicitly that I remain and always re will remain an immoralist. Traditional morals were unbelievable and unacceptable by this generation. But these intellectuals, who imagine that they can invent for us a better moral, which will secure for us a more pleasant, more beautiful and more just world, of course not only ignore how much we owe to traditional morals as guides of how to form an extended order at all, which far extends beyond the local and temporal boundaries of human perception. <coughs> what one has to make clear is that only group selection that means a process of which the individual could not aware, and which he could not explain, could produce habits and lead to the extension which lead to the formation of the extended society which was beyond the comprehension of, uh, of the individual. It is true that institutions which we have not deliberately created, or which we have not desired or approved, are the basis of the multiplication of mankind. I think the best illustration is if I say that I entirely agree in this respect with Karl Marx's contention that it was capitalism which has created the proletariat. But of course not by expropriating anybody or taking from anyone possession they had, but simply by enabling those to survive who had no possessions. In that sense, the capitalism Proletariat is a creation of capitalism. Capitalism has given life to the proletariat. In the same sense in which practices which we intensely dislike and have not wished uh, are the creation of the extended society as a whole. It is perhaps significant and worth mentioning at least some modern philosophers of a rationalist and positivist bent find David Hume's theory of morals wholly unintelligible. To Hume, of course, the institution of property was a prototype of moral institutions and the greater part of his treatise, which is devoted by morals, is wholly devoted to the theory of property. Hume still believed that no one can doubt that the convention for the distinction of property and for the stability of possession is of all circumstances the most necessary for the establishment of human society, and that after the agreement for the fixing and observing this rule, there remains little or nothing to be done to the settling of perfect harmony and concord. Now compare the comments of a modern Oxford philosopher on this. Mr. B. M. Barry, some 20 years ago, 
comments on this, that although Hume uses the expression rules of conduct to cover such things as property rules, justice is now analytically tied to desert and need, that one could quite properly say that some of what Hume calls rules of justice were unjust. What happened? By redefining moral concepts, moral intellectuals thus succeed to make them appear as tools for the satisfaction of our desires, but at the same time deprive us, deprive, yes, us, of the power to guide us to the reach to reach our conscious aims. What this attitude of modern rationalist philosophers makes explicit is, however, nothing less than that private or several property is one of the chief moral foundations of evolved ethics and modern civilization is, in their view, to be replaced by a constructivistic ethics which demands common ownership and direction of the use of the means of production to agreed aims. Now this, however, is a conflict which is no longer simply a moral conflict in the sense of a conflict within a coherent system of morals. It is a conflict between two wholly different systems of morals, which because of their different aim, origins and aims, have very little in common. On the one hand, a system of grown traditional morals formed by the group selection of cultural evolution and serving the remote effects of human action, of which our reason cannot be aware, but the adaptation to which is necessary if we are to preserve the existing numbers of humanity. And on the other side, an invented or constructivistic morals intended to serve the pleasures of the individuals, that is, which promises to satisfy primitive instincts, yet is incapable of achieving even this. We encounter here but on an earlier occasion, I have called the atavistic roots of all socialist designs. I believe I am not exaggerating when I claim that this is a general, I would say, defining characteristic of the contemporary intellectual that he refuses to concede to traditional morals or conventional wisdom, as I like to call it, an independent and autonomous standing side by side with reasoning, and certainly to deny to it any superiority to reason or that it adds anything to what reason can recognize. The modern intellectual believes that it was man's intellect which enabled him, to enabled him to design his morals, and therefore also puts him in a position where the results of the existing morals are not satisfactory <coughs> to replace them by better invented ones. Is it this belief, neatly expressed in the famous title of a book by a socialist anthropologist, that man made himself, which expresses why some socialist economists accept this idea as their guideline. And this seems to me ultimately the fatal conceit to the larger part of the intellectuals to socialism. Now what I've said so far amounts to the assertion <coughs> that socialism is in the last resort the product of a demonstrable philosophical error which has dominated the intellectuals 
of the last two or three hundred years, and to which only practical sense, but little rational argument has resisted. If you want to test this assertion, try to find a positivist who is not a socialist. I've tried and almost always failed, although Milton Friedman may be an exception. <laughs> Indeed, socialism is a logical consequence if you assume only that is true, which you can rationally prove. But the recognition that the tradition or heritage which rests on group selection has equipped mankind with moral rules which enable them to adapt to circumstances our senses cannot perceive reinstates these modes as is what I have called the certain autonomous power which we are as dependent as we are on our reason. The fact, however, that socialism is a logical result of rationalism does therefore not prove that socialism is right but rather that rationalism is wrong. To recognize that there were limits to the power of individual knowledge was of course at all times the result of the meditation of the profoundest thinkers. The insight that there are other indispensable sources of guidance which made man's successes possible was long confined to religious beliefs so this often came, these often came into conflict with current scientific beliefs. It seems to me that a real scientific analysis of the evolutionary process of group selection forces us to recognize that religious beliefs have preserved for us invaluable rules of conduct which have enabled mankind to achieve its present size and powers and through significant science and particular economics can only now retrospectively discover and thereby show that human reason could never have invented a society of the present extent and now can, must attempt to explain it to defend and preserve its existence. What has equipped us to form the astounding world of human cooperation, far extending our perception, our capacity of direction, was in effect a system of restraints, restraints on our animal instincts, which in consequence we sentimentally dislike and whose functions transcend our intellectual comprehension. It has prevailed only by its success, but man's, uh, man's conceit now threatens to restore his support to these beliefs which philosophy describes as su uh, <coughs> superstitions. The consequence of this would probably be not only a progressive, steadily accelerating decline of our civilization, but even a, literally a decimation of humanity to a size in which all its scientific knowledge would be of little use to it. That's why it seems to me ever more important to make it clear to people at large that the seductive theories of socialism are intellectually not even half right, but all wrong. Professor Hayek has graciously consented to take a few questions from the audience. So if you have May I add, good morning at once, my difficulty with this is my hearing is very defective. If you speak very clearly and very loud, 
I shall make every effort to understand your questions and try to answer it. But it's also very tiring for me, so don't carry on too long. <laughs> Has the professor's book uh, been published yet? And if no, no, I'm afraid. Uh, I ought to tell you the story. It's part of the story of how this particular version was written. The first part, at least, of the book was ready in draft a year ago. I've since been working on the revision. I revised chapter one in three weeks. I've worked on the revision of chapter two for nine months. And the text has at first grown into the size of another little book, and I'm now trying hard to reduce it. I hope now to make the angle of the explanation. This idea of group selection will enable me to bring it down to reasonable size. And I'm experimenting with you to find out whether this idea of group selection really gives an adequate explanation of the central point. Certainly, yes. And have you rejected that as a possibility for your, it's below the level of individual and therefore probably not consciously controllable either? <coughs> oh, well, it's a general problem which I have with all the social biologists. I mean, Dawkins, of course, accounts for a gradual adaptation of instincts to a different world. Now, the time in which this has happened is far too short. I mean, uh, the kind of process which Dawkins speaks is a process which can work over hundreds of thousands of years. But what has happened in the last 50,000 years cannot be accounted for by any kind of biological evolution. You have to resort to what I've called cultural evolution, to a tradition, and then you have to take into account that cultural evolution operates on different principles. Dawkins are purely the principles of the biologist, which are not applicable. Uh, this is just a comment. I, uh, I think that your group selection is not what the biologists have objected to. Uh, that is, they're, what they're thinking about a group selection is something different from what you are uh, thinking about. It is, it is uh, the, uh, uh, the brave baboon who goes to the, the baboon tribe that has brave people who help defend it and uh, they get negative selection of individuals from that, which I don't think is what, um, I don't think, in other words, I, it happens, I, I, I can argue against your group selection too, but I don't think you need to worry about the biologist not. Well, it's not as simple as this. You're partly right. I mean, so far as biologists argue that the changes in instinctive reactions cannot be due to group selection, they are very persuasive. Even there I have some doubts, but I would grant them this. What they would mean is that changes in instincts are not sufficient. And only changes in instincts can be explained biologically. And that the other, which they completely disregard, that there is a distinct process of cultural evolution. If you take, since I mentioned E. O. Wilson before, his social biology, their tendency is to reduce it all to biological evolution. And that can't be done. If for no other reason, the reason I just mentioned is that time has been far too short in order to possibly produce the thing by way of biological evolution. We have to find a parallel but distinct process. And the chapter in the book which precedes this uh, is mainly the words upon to bring out much more clearly than I could do in my introductory work the distinction between the mechanism of biological and cultural evolution. Once you have made this clear that they operate on different principles, it becomes very important to distinguish because by the different mechanism you can produce different things. And amongst the distinctions I left out, one uh, perhaps ought to be the most important, precisely that while biological evolution operates extremely slowly, cultural evolution can operate extremely fast.
looks like they're all very concerned about tiring you out, Professor Hayek. <laughs> very <laughs> kind <Well>. of you. <laughs> 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 we want to thank you so much for giving us a preview of, of your book and helping you winnow it down to chapter size. <laughs> there will be, those doors will open miraculously in a few moments and there will be a reception uh, with, with soft drinks, coffee and tea and we, that we're about five minutes sooner than they had expected Hi us, but we can Highly automatized. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you all for coming and please stay around for the reception, Brent. <laughs>